welcome to Southern Steep, the public health and social justice podcast brought to you by NASDAD, a nonpartisan nonprofit association missioned to end the intersecting epidemics of HIV, rival hepatitis, and related conditions. Much like Brewing Stronger Tea, this platform aims to brew stronger community by centering the voices of community leaders and their innovative work in the Southern United States. I am your host, Torian L. Baskerville, and I am here with my esteemed co host, the one, the only, Mr. Isaiah Webster III. How are you today? I'm great, Torian. How are you? I am doing amazingly well. I am super excited to do this episode with you. I, you know, there's been a little talk that you, you know, you enjoy our other co hosts and co hosting with them. And so I'm excited to have this opportunity with you on today. It's really weird. This is only the second time we've, we've hosted together. The first being that really interesting conglomerate with Nicole and Bianca. So I'm really excited that we get to forge this, this kind of new bond. And I think it's going to be great. And our guest today is amazing. So this is going to be fun. Yeah, this is going to be amazing. Um, so, you know, as you can hear from the excitement, we're really excited about today's episode and our guest. Um, he is a community leader, an activist, and someone who I personally appreciate. Um, he is the founder and executive director of Mobilizing Our Brothers Initiative Incorporated. He is also a fellow Virgo. Um, Deshaun Usher. Uh, Deshaun, welcome to Southern Steep. Hey, thank you for having me. Of course, Um, you know, we've been thinking about like who amazing people can we interview and it's only right that we, you know, at some point um, invited you to the space. So jumping right in and before we get really into the meat of the conversation, you know, um, how are you? How, you know, we're still dealing with the panty you know, a pandemic, um, stuff is still going on in the world. How are you? How are you taking care of yourself? Um, all of that great stuff. I'm doing great um, in the sense of that I've been truly prioritizing my self-care um, mixed in with being able to ensure that I'm productive. Um, I know my limits when it comes to work, setting those boundaries. Um, Currently, I'm in Carousel for the month of February, um, reclaiming my Black History Month. (laughs) And so just really excited to like be here um, and work remotely, but also be in a space to like enjoy like the weather, like once that six o'clock time frame comes and just totally intentionally disconnect um, because it's a lot harder to do, you know, like folks aren't going on vacations, folks aren't, help, you don't have weekends anymore, <laughs> you don't have evenings anymore um, because your home is your office. And so it was just really important to think about like how to take that time to do that. Nice. Now, did you say you're in Curacao? Yes, in <sighs> Curacao. Listen, that sounds like a beautiful time. <laughs> it is. I will show you the view. I know folks can't see it, but if I step outside, it's a lovely 85 degrees. Um, the low is 72, and uh, there's a cool island breeze. And, and when, when you you're listen- not... Go ahead. No, and I was like, and when you listen to this, feel free to get a pina colada or a mojito. <laughs> and when you're not there, you have the pleasure of living in New York City. So exactly what part of your residential life is unpleasant? Well, I actually moved from New York City to, yes, I moved to Atlanta um, in August of 2020. So I, I'm still back and forth between like Atlanta and New York. Um, and then eventually when LA opens up, I'll be there to do some stuff too. But yeah, I moved. <laughs> that I feel like that, Tori, and that could be a whole nother podcast between, <laughs> you know, Black gay men living in New York City and Black gay men living in Atlanta. That could be a whole topic. That so. can be a whole topic. <laughs> Definitely. And, and why those transitions, right? What what prompts those transitions? Um 
No, it can be. I was, oh, I meant I could answer part of it. I meant for me, it was the pandemic of thinking of like, it's a, like if you've ever lived in New York, and I'm sure some folks have, you realize that like there's, you don't get the most bang for your buck. Um, and for me, it was thinking that, okay, my lease was ending at the end of August. It was, rent was going up. It w- wasn't, <laughs> they weren't like, hey, we're going to pause. Hey, we're going to, it was like, nope, that 2% increase um, was still happening. And I was like, yeah, I can't look at my neighbors anymore. I, like my living room had became my office, which wasn't set to be my office. So looking at a wall or looking at my neighbors and I was like, yeah my amenity cannot be an elevator. Now, correct me if I'm, where, where were you born? Like, are you originally from the Northeast? Are you originally a Southerner? Because Tori and I, we've had, I don't know if you've been listening to our episodes, I've been giving him a little bit of, um, what's the word? Hard time. Uh, hard time, because he's not a Southerner, but he tries to be. So, oh. Deshaun, what are you really? <laughs> I am I am truly from the South. The yes! South, the South Bronx. Um <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> born and raised where I spent most of my days <laughs> that I relocated <laughs> to school oh, in Tennessee. <laughs> I love that setup, Big Sean. That was a girl fresh friend. <laughs> yes, but I but I spent like my college years in Tennessee and um throughout that time, like a lot of time after graduating and going back to New York um, in the South. Um, there was always something special about the South that I literally left New York to go there because I wanted to see where everyone else was coming from. Um, and I know that some people think New York is like the greatest city in the world, which it, it, it is, <laughs> but it's also, um, I'm happy that I grew up there But I'm also happy that as an adult, I was able to see other things um, outside of New York. I think one of the things we wanted to kind of, um, in the the whole getting to know you, kind of like the second thing we wanted to ask you about was kind of like the the beginnings of NOBI. And and, and do you use NOBI as an acronym or, because that's how, that's what I've been saying. MOBI, I'm sorry. MOBI? I was like, I I don't use NOBI as an acronym. (laughs) That'd we be use a, no be like, nowhere. Right, nowhere. Like, that'd be a no, no be, no be for me. <laughs> when, I, when I tell you I call myself doing homework and I got all kind of notes and I'm up here saying no be. No <laughs> be. <laughs> the look on your face, though. You were like, yeah, was like what is he talking about? Like, no be. <laughs> closely related. It's, yeah. Um, well, the work with Moby, um, so Mobilizing Our Brothers Initiative, um, it it started out of my work that I was doing um, around community engagement. Um, I was doing behavioral research studies and biomedical um, clinical research trials and a bunch of other like stuff. And it was just thinking about how the community that I was able to like reach and engage into these different clinical trials, um, didn't realize like what was happening in front of them, right? They didn't know what resources existed. And it was unfortunate because I, being from the same community that I was recruiting and engaging into these like different um, like studies, it was thinking that like, well, you know, there's this research to reality gap um, and you don't need to wait five years in order to know about PrEP. And you don't need to wait five years to know where you can go to get like an HIV test um, because like we're studying like what are those best practices and behaviors. Um, And the fact that there were so many organizations that had got money for black gay men that never literally was not doing anything for them, but they were grandfathered in, right? Into health departments, into um, foundations, into corporate sponsors, into walks um, <laughs> that they were doing. And part of it was because it, it it's like the legacy of an organization, um, which is great. And it's great that we have that history, but it's also a time when um, nonprofits work to a way of like not necessarily serving organization, serving the community that they're um, trying to truly focus um, versus like getting money 
and usually keeping it either in-house or to pay for staff and then don't have adequate budgets to actually do um, community engagement to reach people. And so when I had came up with Moby, it was thinking about like, what can I do to understand the industry that I'm in, but totally flip it to where most grants that come into organizations, I would say what, like 80% of the money goes to staff, um, then say program. But it's like, but when you look at like the money that actually goes to that targeted population, it you're lucky if you even get like 10% of that, right? Um, and so for me, it was thinking about having a conversation with the New York Blood Center that like, hey, if we actually get this grant, it would be cool if we could, one, only put me on it because we also know like how staff eats up like funding um, with like fringe and then indirect costs. And the more staff that are on it, the less money that you actually have for the program. And so I was like, yeah, just put me on it. Um, let's get consultants that are like these community members um, that like are in, you know, different expertise because the other thing too was that at that particular time, I was one of the only few like black gay men working at the organization. And so you can't say that we're gonna do a program for black gay men and staff it with people that aren't black gay men. Um, and so they, there's like, okay, yeah, okay, cool. Like, yeah, we'll do it. Um, and so the shock <laughs> was like, great. I was like, so let, let's just continue to see like what it is that we can do. And so knowing that like a good 80% of the money that we're getting for Moby goes back into the community um, and creates like these um, like opportunities for other black gay men to contribute to their community um, while also funneling that money into the programming that we're doing. Um, I think that has truly led to like the success of the program. I think that that's like vital, right? And you you you've dropped a couple of nuggets in that in that um, thoughtful um, response, right? And I think one of the things that I'm thinking about is like I've attended um, a couple of Moby events, right? And they're not, in my experience, the traditional um, events that programs put on, right? It is very non-traditional and it's really a holistic approach to how you're engaging community. Can you talk through like what made you take that approach, but also like how did you leverage that non-traditional format to really get individuals into the services and care that they needed? Yeah, I I think a large degree of it is that like I've been around the world, like you've been around the world, we've been around the world. We have literally seen so many different programs, so many different conferences, so many different initiatives, so many different like over like our like time and career. Um, like I started um, like doing community engagement work at Nashville Cares um, with like Dwayne Jenkins um, and he oversaw like Nashville Black Pride um, and the Brothers United Network. And I was running the Young Brothers United program. And so part of this is like, it's like this history step of like, how does a chicken become an egg? Or no, how does an egg become a chicken? Um, <laughs> but, but it was very much of like working in Nashville at the time, um, like in 2007 through 2011, like there were no resources or programming like for black queer folks in the entire state of Tennessee. The one program that existed, I was running it. Um, and so just to think about to be in the South, to not have resources um, to do anything. And so it's like, you know, you had to be creative. You had to really think about like, how do we make this work? How do we bring people in? How do we pull folks in? And so I knew that I, was able to literally make something happen with no money. Um, and so when you think about, well, damn, like what would it look like if we actually had money? <laughs> then it's like, oh, the sky's the limit because then we could actually do 
so much more. Like there shouldn't be a reason that people come to events um, and don't get the same experience that they would get like at like these larger organizations like galas and fundraisers and dinners that like they're doing because that that's where their money goes, right? Because it then brings in more money. But it's thinking about what would it look like if we actually put that money into like these experiences that black gay men like could see themselves, right? When they walk into the room, you just feel a different aura of warmth in invitation. You feel a different aura of like, oh, someone actually spent time into thinking about from the time I walk into the door to the time I like, you know, go through this program to the time I um, might interact with like a community service um, provider to the time that I leave. Um, and then people share their experiences about like what that looked like. I think one of the coolest things about it is that we serve, like we're really this bridge is what I tell people that like we act as a bridge. Like we know all of the different community um, service providers. We know which ones are good. We know which ones aren't. Um, and the ones that are good are usually invited to the table and the ones that aren't, we, we, try, we try to bring them along. Um, because it's important because it's like, we know that those organizations aren't going to go anywhere. Right. Um, and, but it's important to let them know like why their staff should be there. Um, because they're often saying that like our community is hard to reach, but it's not when before COVID, you know, I would see them every Thursday at trappy hour. Um, or I would see them every like Saturday or somewhere like at the DL. Um, and so it's just thinking that like, we're not hard to reach. It's just the way that folks have been trying to engage us hasn't been innovative and it hasn't been fun. And it hasn't been like from a perspective of we're willing to put our money into this community to see a different result. So Torian mentioned <clears throat> how he was um, really excited to experience some of the events that that you and your organization put on. Um, I am really fascinated by this digital film series, Moby Talks. Mm -hmm. I have, I mean, Deshaun, you know how long I've been doing this work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen something this, what's the word, authentic and kind of like gritty in a long, long time. So... I, I don't want to talk about all the many programs that you have, but could you just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about how the Moby Talks came about and why it was so important to do this digital film series? Yeah. So the funny thing is, is that we had did the talk. So the talks were like these, the talk, Moby Talks is a series of um, personal and professional development, like talks where we try to connect like the community with like, leaders in different industries. Um, and when we say that, we mean across industries, there is no discrimination. And that's also the other thing when people think industries, there's like, oh, we need media, we need blah, blah, blah. But it's like, no, we want like the OnlyFan stars, we want the web series people, we want um, the doctors, of course, we want the lawyers, we want the media moguls, but we also want it to be like rooted in like the leadership that like we know that people have, right? The influence that they have. Um, but we would do it intentionally with like maybe up to 120 folks um, because it was also something special about it being like a smaller size event versus it trying to be this big um, massive like festival, which we also do. But with the talks, I was telling um, the team, I was like, you know, we do these three talks across the like city in different boroughs. And then we've done a couple of the talks in Atlanta and Birmingham um, in DC with like conferences. But it was like, but what would it look like if we were able to create the same experience that we've done in person, like on a digital like platform? Um, so that we could reach more people inside of their homes at the times that they're able to like watch it and view it and enjoy it, but also like include the elements that we like would have, right? And so if people attended a Moby Talk, you would experience like a entertainment like component. So there would be a dancer or a singer or someone doing poetry 
um, you would experience people talking about like what their like life journey had has been to guide us along that path so that one, we know that it's possible. And then two, like we also have people that we can reference um, if we think that, oh, I might want to do this. Let me contact or reach out to this person or see who who else like they're connected to. Um, and then Laquan Dawson, who's our visual um, director, like took the idea. And so we shot this like before COVID um, and COVID had like stopped <laughs> our production. But it was also one of those things where it's like, it, it, it came at a beautiful time too, when everybody was at home. Um, and so to think about like a digital series, cause we also were thinking, we was like, oh, we'll probably get hopefully 300 people to watch it because <laughs> before COVID, again, we knew that people had like busy and, um, and active lives. And so I think that was the thing of just really trying to capture the moments of what we've done in person for it to happen like digitally. Well, congratulations. We will definitely link to, you know, it in the description. I love them. I've watched the first two. I'm I'm going to watch the third one once we finish recording this podcast. It is really good. So congrats on, on some really excellent work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think um, it's it's definitely been, it's definitely an experience um, to um, interact with Moby events. Um, cause it's really thoughtful. It's, it's really well-planned. The team is really organized. Um, you know, and I really appreciate, um, how you integrate community partnerships into your community engagement, right? It's really, it's really a thoughtful process of like an intentionality of how, what organizations, what entities, right? What industries can I um, mobilize to 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 get the goal that I'm re- looking for out of the community and for the community, right? And so, I remember um, where you guys had like, if you go and get an HIV test, right, or you go see a provider, you'll get some sort of like. Um, Um, like a sticker or some kind of indication that then you can get into one of the larger events for, right? And so can you talk through how you, really the process of like leveraging those community partnerships um, that really um, got to the meat of of addressing the community needs? Yeah, so you're talking about like our test for ticket programs that we did for, our festival. Um, And so Test for Tickets isn't like a new idea. Um, Like in public health, like a lot of folks are familiar with like incentivized, like testing to get into whatever, whatever. But it was just thinking about how do we like turn it into something that we know our community like would be interested in, right? So our Test for Tickets was um, this like take on like taking ownership of your health, right? So it wasn't just like go get an HIV test, which is usually the limit um, within our community. It was thinking about like we looked at like who were these community providers and what is it that they offered. So um, for instance, like one of the community partners was like the Ryan Center. Um, and we like partnered with them to really just highlight that like you can go here and you can do a nutrition like um, assessment. You can go here and you can do um, just regular like lab work. Uh, you, you could do a pharmacy prescription refill there. Um, you can do a Zumba class there <laughs> because they offered all of these different other services other than just like that was related to your sexual health, right? And it was that was really important because we can't say that we're looking at people like holistically um, and not necessarily like, cause every time they walk into the door, particularly at a community um, service provider, it's it's HIV. Like, it, so it's like either, do you want to get tested or do you want to get like on treatment? And it's like, whoa, I, I, I kind of saw that you have like a career program here, but I guess I, I, I don't qualify yet because I'm black and gay um, <laughs> and you need your numbers. So and then it's like, then we'll walk you through, right? And it's right. like, it shouldn't have to be like this 15 step program before like you can see someone that showed up to your organization um, seeking 
you don't even know, right? And so it's really thinking about how do we list out the services that are available? Um, how do we let people know that, hey, um, I always use this example because like it's a well-known example, but like Callen Lord um, is a clinic in New York City that like is primarily for LGBTQ folks, right? Um, but they're also overwhelmed in their one clinic. Now they have multiple sites, but it's also when you think about like if you're a black gay man in indoor coming of age at any point, right? And you hear about a clinic that like is for LGBTQ people, what do you want to do? Go there. Callen Lord is amazing. However, <laughs> everyone cannot go to Callen Lord in New York City. And so just think about like what the backlog is for people to get an appointment. So if someone wanted to get an HIV test or wanted to be a new patient at Callen Lord, on average, it might take a month or like a couple of months for you to get into the door. And that's just for your first assessment. And there's nothing against that, but it's because like they're really doing a great job, but it is thinking there's other services that you literally can walk in today and be seen that yeah. that say that they're doing like stuff for black gay men. Um, and so it was just thinking about how do we highlight those other organizations so that everyone isn't just going to this one clinic, right? Because of what they specialized in that, like giving people the autonomy to understand that, like I can walk into any clinic at any point and like talk to somebody about like what my actual health needs are. Um, so I think like a large degree of that is the empowerment of that. Um, and then when we saw that there were gaps, we created those moments. So then we would do like the, um, like a financial literacy class because we like people said that they were interested in that and no one off that <laughs> at any of the community clinics, especially for black gay men. Um, and then we did like fitness classes because not everyone can afford a gym membership. Um, and then we offered like cooking classes because people like wanted to do like meal preps. And so it was just thinking about again, like what was the community needs that we had heard from like when we did the talks when we first launched, we did the talks and then we did like these needs assessments around what areas and things that people were interested in. And so that was how we were able to prepare and know what activities for the test for ticket program um, that we would like prioritize. Because this podcast focuses on the South, we absolutely wanted to kind of ask you about kind of Moby's plans and kind of um, initiatives in the South. But I wanted to kind of as maybe ask you two questions in one. So if you wanted to talk generally about like, just kind of like what your work is in the South currently, but I'm also curious about a lot of the things that you do are sex positive. They might be considered edgy. And I'm, I'm wondering, do you encounter a lot of folks in the South that say, Ooh, we can't do that. We can't get away with that. And like, how do you navigate those types of conversations with people to to shift it to what they can do as opposed to what they can't do. Yeah. So we haven't, so we've done like a Moby Talks in Atlanta um, and in Birmingham. Um, and we did them in partnerships with like conferences that were happening. Um, and so currently like Moby is largely funded to do stuff like well, not to do stuff, but like largely funded through like the New York City Department of Health. Um, and so most of the programming, as you can imagine, is centered in New York City. Um, I've been fortunate to continually like do work within the South as like technical assistance or capacity building and um, like a consultant on a couple of different things or like literally a phone call with people about how to do like programming. Um, and so I think for us, it's thinking that like one of the things that we definitely wanted, one of the things I want to do with Moby is think about the expansion of like what we're able to do inside of New York City um, and across the different boroughs, um, like across the country, particularly in the South, um, especially since I now live there. But <laughs> also thinking like the South doesn't need like another like, um, community-based organization like realistically it's like it's it's an overload especially where I where I currently live and so but it is thinking about like 
the South does need, like, again, like that bridge connector, like organization that can like actively like cultivate community, but then also like work towards um, like referring people to the different services that like are available. Um, I think oftentimes we don't think about like ways that we work in collaboration. Um, the beautiful thing about Moby is that we don't provide any direct services at all, <laughs> which also is like, you know, a no competition zone um, <laughs> in the sense of like, we're not trying to get HIV testing numbers. We're not trying to get um, like, you know, these other like we're You don't have to swallow a handful of pills <laughs> right. to come through the door. Right. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, it, it, it's like we're creating a space for people to exist and we're creating a opportunity for organizations that do those direct services to really connect with the community, like at that community level. Um, I definitely think that there's certain things that like are transferable, like in the South for sure, but other things that I know that like probably won't be. And so when we think about like, when, you, when you're when you saying like some stuff like might be a little like edgy or risque or blah, blah, it's like, have you been in the South um, in the sense of that, like the South, you know, they're, they're not just Southern bells um, in the sense of, and we know this to be true. Um, I don't know love, what you're talking about. <laughs> I, well, I, all I do is sip my tea and, and read my Sunday paper. Yes. Well, Torian does. And oh. so, <laughs> but make a fair point. Fair point. But, but it's, but it's like, again, in the sense of that, like, I think what I would love to do in the South is make it normal in the sense of that, like, we know what people are doing in the South. We know things have not stopped in the South. And I know that because we've all seen it, um, like on Twitter, on Instagram, on wherever else you find your co online content. But it, but it's important to just understand that, like, we can't ignore it, right? Or act as if it doesn't exist. And so I think for Moby, we give people that opportunity again to exist and to be um, while also saying, Hey, well, you know, there's a couple of things over here that you might like, or there might be a couple of things over here that you might like, and how can we help you grow personally and professionally if you want to at all, if right. not, there's a festival you can come to um, that will be fully entertaining <laughs> right, and right. highlighting folks. I want to get your opinion, and this is really, this is a little kind of coming out of uh, left field. I want to get your opinion on um, pop culture and visibility for Black gay men in particular. And mm -hmm. so, you know, full disclosure, I'm a Black gay man in my uh, 40s. And so I've seen some, some evolution mm -hmm. in the last few years. I would love to get your perspective on what do you think we're seeing in terms of visibility and in terms of um, Black gay men in the pop culture writ large. Mm. That's the question. You can take any angle, any aspect yeah. of that you wish. <laughs> no, so it it, it definitely, it, it's an interesting question and a complex question. Um, and so I'm also the program officer, communities of color at GLAAD. Um, and GLAAD is like the world's largest LGBTQ media advocacy organization. Um, so at GLAAD, we do a lot of work um, and, and this is also interesting because it's like with GLAD, I do a lot of work in the South, um, <laughs> but with Moby, it's like, oh, we're inching towards it. Um, but it is just thinking, but like part of the work that I've been doing, um, like in the South are like these media engagement trainings with organizations about like how to tell their stories and how to talk about their programs. Um, but also coming from a place of knowing that like I too used to run a program in the South and at a time when there was no social media that made it a little bit easier <laughs> for you to advertise. Um, but it is thinking that like when it comes to the stories and pop culture and what we are seeing or aren't seeing, I think it's important to talk about like the visibility, like there might seem like there's a blip, right? Or it might seem as if like there's a buzz around Black queer queerness right now, but it's also understanding like, Who's at the top making those decisions? Who's greenlitting 
those decisions of what you do see, right? And what makes it to the public eye. Um, and so there might be plenty of Black gay characters that are written that will never be cast, right? And there may be plenty of Black gay um, like musicians that like have what it takes to go far and probably more talented than some of people's favorites, but won't, like won't make it like to a record label. Um, but it is thinking that I think COVID and the advancement of like what happened this past June with Black Lives Matter and like that like convergence <laughs> that happened where people were forced to be like, damn, it's real. We, we have to talk about it, right? Um, I think that part now has enabled folks to hold people accountable, right? So when everyone last year put out their Black Lives Matter posts um, during Pride and put out their Black Lives Matter, it's like, great, happy that it does. Now, mm. show it and prove it that it like actually exists because there's people, again, that will never have the opportunity if we don't like start thinking outside of just the, just the players. Like, that's cool. Like, you know, have a bunch of friends, that like are moving and shaking and doing great things, but they're not enough because in yeah. order for them to actually succeed, we need people that are higher than them and higher than them that like usually don't look like us. Mm. Mm -hmm. I completely um, agree. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and I asked the question because, you know, oftentimes when I see images of us, people that kind of w that you, Tori and I might be able to relate to, they are in an ad about um, prep. Are there mm -hmm. in an ad about HIV medication? I don't know if the two of you saw this, but the Cadbury people are currently in a little bit of controversy because they had two men sharing an egg and they were really mm -hmm. close, like they were kissing, but they weren't. And the, and the gooey egg was in between <laughs> them and people are all up in arms. I say that because the two men they used for that ad were, were cis white men. And I never see... Um, at least I statement, I never see those sorts of things where it's two mm. men of color. I've, I've seen it where it's a white man and a, and a man of color. But I, I, I don't think we've arrived yet at a consistent visibility of Black love mm -hmm. to like two Black men or two men of color can be the central part of this message frame as a standalone thing. And I was, I mean, you know, it's something that I'm constantly seeing as like a small marker of progress mm. for society. And from my perspective, we're just not there yet. Yeah. I mean, have you seen the Etsy commercial, the Christmas one, like where it was like two black gay men um, that like one of them was going home for like the holidays and like it was like yes, a family. Yes, yes, I did see that one. Yeah. Th that was probably one of the most moving like mm. unexpected commercials i was thinking and of, relatable oh, and relatable right where it's like oh hey welcome to the family literally that was the line i remember <laughs> um but it, but you're absolutely right is that like one we don't often see black love um and so we may and so that's the other thing is that you could see like a black gay character but or a black trans character but like what is their like love interest like what mm -hmm. does that actually look like right it's like okay well we got you to the screen <laughs> is one thing but it's like but who is it that like you show them with and if you don't see black people with black people because we always see white people with white people and white people could be with any anyone right exactly um, but black people always have to be like that support to someone else and we're mm -hmm. always like that other and so it's something really powerful when organizations or companies like intentionally prioritize that we are going to not just one put a black man or a black trans woman or a black um non-binary person mm -hmm. like on this campaign but we're going to actually showcase like their love in their and even if it's not their real like life love person it's just thinking that like we want to intentionally show and embrace like what black love looks like you know isaiah that that can be a whole episode in and of yes. itself invite me back <laughs> <laughs> right. right that could be a whole episode um because i think that is absolutely true right and that's why i appreciate about moby and and the 
li- literally the leveraging of Black queer men um, and Black queer people as a whole that Moby is intentional about, right? Um, and and it's so necessary and it's so timely and it's so important, right? Um, because, you know, when we think about the mainstream medium, uh, media, it's not often depicted, right? Or if it is depicted, it's not depicted in a in a healthy way, right? Because, you know, you, you see some depiction of Black love, but it's never, or it's not always in a very healthy way, right? It's very, you know, combative and unhealthy um, in the exchange. And so it's, you know, it, it makes, for me, it makes a Moby, right, um, so much more valuable and so much more important. Um, and so, yeah, like I, and I really also, and just add something is that I think it's also like thinking about like the intentionality of what black love looks like. Right. And so for Moby, it's been really important for me when I, cause when you were saying like how, like we've showcased like the different aspects of like being black and queer, it's like, it's important to understand that like, we did not get here alone, right? And so we're very intentional of bringing along and understanding our privilege that we have Mm -hmm. of being cisgendered males, of being like black males at times, right? So there's certain moments where it's like, like being a black man isn't, the easiest thing, but then there's other moments in society that you know that like you have a privilege over certain communities and certain groups. And so being able to think about, again, that intentionality of like black women that don't like cis black women that don't get the same opportunities or the same resources, black trans women that are finally getting like their visibility and resources funneled into their community so that they can do things for their community. Um, And it's not in conjunction with black gay men um, because it's like, we love them and they may be people that we date or they may be our friends, but it's also just understanding that like without thinking about how you, when you have a privilege um, and when you have resources, like what other communities can you farther and bring along to? Um, And I think like that's been like one of the beauties of Moby also is like being that inclusive enough to, even though it's mobilizing our brothers, but it's also understanding that like all mankind is essential in all mankind is important, um, especially within the black community. Deshaun, I, you know, um, outside of professional, you and I are really close friends. Um, and I, and I really, I mean that. And so it's always great to have conversations with you and talk through personal and professional and life things. Um, and so, um, I just want to say it's been a pleasure. Um, this conversation has been fruitful. You have dropped a mini of nuggets um, in this conversation. And so I want to thank you for your presence um, and your um, and the work that you and Moby um, are doing um, for the community. It's, it's important and we want to elevate that. And so um, we are excited and thank you for your time. No problem. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Again, I have long admired Isaiah and the work that you've been doing at NASDAQ, so keep it up. Um, (laughs) But also Torian, um, the work that like you've been doing, um, it's important to think about like even this particular platform, right? Of like, how do you take these conversations outside of the conversations that we may so often have with each other to make sure that it like has like this community approach and this community um, like palette where people can like take it and understand. So thank you both for having me. I literally wouldn't have spent any other day in Carousel with anyone else on a Friday. (laughs) Rub it in. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Meanwhile, it's 30 degrees here in DC. Right. And icy and snowy. (laughs) Do not want to go back. (laughs) Good to see you, Deshaun. We loved having you on. Come back anytime. Anytime. So invite me back. I'll be here. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect.
On this episode of Southern Charm, we are highlighting NASDAQ's uh, 2021 Southern Coalition of Advancing Gay Men Summit, um, taking place next week on March 10th and the 11th. Um, Building upon the work of Gay Men's Health Equity Work Group, the Southern Coalition for Advancing Gay Men is a community of providers from health departments and community-based organizations in the South who work together to identify and meaningfully address the needs and challenges of gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men in the Southern United States. This year's summit focuses on providing attendees with the space to meet and network with others doing HIV work with Black, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men to discuss current strategies, innovations, and lessons learned regarding community engagement and retention in HIV services, how to address social determinants of health, and community partnerships, and to identify opportunities to enhance and strengthen current community engagement Um, addressing social determinants of health and community partnership strategies within their programs and jurisdictions to improve service provision and health equity for Black, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. If you represent a community-based organization or health department located in the South who prioritizes work with gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men in the South, and you would like to be a part of the Southern Coalition for Advancing Gay Men, or would like to attend this year's summit, feel free to reach out to myself, Torian L. Baskerville at T-B-A-S-K-E-R-V-I-L-L-E at NASDAD, N-A-S-T-A-D dot org, or see the link in the episode description below. Now, it's true that Deshaun is presenting during the summit, correct? This is very true. And so um, if you would like to hear more of Deshaun um, and the work that they're doing. Um, You definitely want to be a part of that. And we'll have some other great um, panelists as well. I cannot believe the time flew by so fast. I mean, it's almost been, I'm looking at the clock. It's almost been an hour. Deshaun is so, (laughs) I mean, he's just funny, first of all, but um, he just has a great sense of humor. And I'm so glad, you know, I've known him for a long time. I'm glad that if I had to mess up the name of someone's organization, it would be his. That that it was him and not like someone I don't know. (laughs) I was very proud of myself. Did you hear? I was like, no, me, no, me, no, me. But that's not it. But, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, you were being a bit prophetic because he also talked about normalizing, right, conversations. And so maybe, you know, there's a chance for a no normalizing brother, our brother's initiative. In the maybe region. they'll be, maybe he'll start a Nobi now to go with the Moby. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh, Isaiah, I have thoroughly enjoyed um, this episode with you. Um, I am certain that I am probably now um, the best co host that you've had thus far. And, um, you know, I'm excited for many more opportunities to co host with you. You do realize that Nicole and Bianca do listen to the episodes <laughs> that they're not on. So they're going to hear that. I know. <laughs> I know. I mean, you know, th- there was a little bit of shade and 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 love spread in other episodes about how great they are as co-hosts, and I, you know, I'm just throwing it back at them a little bit. That's all. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, shall we? <laughs> let's just let's just sign off while we're here. <laughs> I'm Isaiah Webster, and I am Torian Baskerville. Thank you all for listening, and until next time.